Assalamu alaikum. I am Dr. Abhi Lakhba Kazi from the Neurosurgery Department, JPMC. And today I'll be presenting on the management of spinal cord injuries. So let's first begin this lecture by defining what a spinal cord injury actually is. A spinal cord injury is defined as an insult to the spinal cord that in turn results in change which can be temporary or permanent. So it results in a temporary or permanent change in the cord's normal motor, sensory as well as autonomic functions. This insult can be traumatic. It can also be atraumatic. It can uh, result from any injury, any, uh, sorry, it can also result from any kind of disease. However, the, uh, in our presentation today, in our lecture today, we will focus only on the traumatic causes of the spinal cord injury. Okay, so traumatic cause, cause of spinal cord injury will elaborate it further on, but undeniably, globally, approximately between 250,000 to 500,000 people, they suffer from a spinal cord injury each year. It is one of the major causes of morbidity and severe disability in the affected patients and it also has tremendous physical, psychological as well as economical impact. Now these patients they have to live a life with often permanent disability which does not affect the patient. It does not only affect the patient but it also affects his whole family. Uh, the pa these people they have a diminished quality of life. They have uh, a lot of financial and socioeconomic constraints and overall it just impacts the life of these patients and it is not only the one person which is being affected it is the whole family especially if the patient who is being affected by the spinal cord injury is the only breadwinner of the family and that is what happens in third world countries that the breadwinner of the family there's, there's only one breadwinner and if the patient becomes handicapped or bedridden due to a spinal cord injury that it will affect the whole family Okay, so the important thing to know right uh, right now is that spinal cord injury is preventable. It is very much preventable because the causes of the spinal cord injury itself are preventable. And as you can see in this chart over here, approximately 39.2% of these patients come with a spinal cord injury secondary to a road traffic accident. So a motor vehicular accident is a cause in majority of the patients who present to you uh, with a spinal cord injury. And then 28.3 again uh, occurs as a result of falls then 14.6 occurred as a result of a any act of violence it can be an assault it can be stab wound can be a gunshot injury uh, and then 9.7 percent of other or unknown causes and 8.2 percent of these injuries are related to sports again i would like would like to uh, focus on the motor vehicle accidents and the falls okay and these are preventable so if the patients uh, if these people they take proper precautionary measures they can you know uh, it can help them in avoiding something which is completely and totally life changing and also this is quite variable because we're talking where this chart was uh, taken from a study that was from a lot of studies that was studied in mainly in, develop, in developed countries uh, in our country or in third world countries falls also account for a bigger chunk sometimes even more than the motor vehicle accident itself but apart from that it is very clear that RTS road traffic accidents and falls account for majority of the cases of spinal cord injuries and also uh, as you can see car accidents the most common cause of spinal cord injury they account for 38 percent of spinal cord injuries in our country and uh, from what we have experienced so far in our ward and working in our wards most of these patients are bike riders they uh, they are motorcycle bike riders and they usually they don't wear helmets and that exposes the cervical spine it properly exposes the cervical spine and that is why these patients often present to us with high cervical cord injuries and with fractures and with the disabilities they are often permanent so it is without doubt that we know from over here that majority of these patients are males and why are they males because males they're most exposed to having RTs and falls, especially in developing countries. It is a male, and even in undeveloped countries, it is a male uh, of the family that goes out to work, that goes out to earn bread for the family, and that is why they're much more exposed to encountering any kind of road traffic accidents, falls, uh, occupational hazards that can lead to a spinal cord injury. And also, younger population, that is from 16 to 30 years, have been, uh, it has been, there's been a change in the trend 
early on it was the middle age group but now since a lot of younger people they being mobilized earlier to working and even to achieve education it is the age group of 16 to 30 years which is again at increased risk of developing a spinal cord injury second to second to an rta uh, fall or any of these hazards okay, so let's begin a lecture in first uh, we'll start with basic anatomy of the cord of the vertebra of the bony anatomy and then we'll move on to talk a little bit about the ligamentous and the soft tissue anatomy of the, of the vertebral column so we all know that the vertebral column is properly divided into cervical thoracic and lumbar spine we have the seven cervical vertebrae we have the 12th th thoracic vertebrae and then we have the lumbar and the fused sacral vertebrae as well as the coccyx okay, so this is the cervical vertebrae the dorsal spine and the lumbar lumbar sacral region so the cervical spine has a normal lordotic curvature the dorsal spine has a kyphotic curvature and then the lumbar sacral spine again has a lordotic curvature right and as you can see that the cervical spine is obviously the most exposed portion of the spine and majority of the patients who present to us with a spinal cord injury present to us with cervical fractures and they usually do not have a good prognosis the dorsal spine spine is relatively um, it is more protected because anteriorly we have the rib cage it also has more better stability so fractures of the dorsal spine usually are stable and then again we have the lumbar sacral region it is the dorsal lumbar region the the transition zone between the dorsal spine and the lumbar and the lumbar spine this transition zone is again more amenable to fracture so excluding the cervical spine apart from the cervical spine the most common region of a, of a fracture of a spinal fracture would be d12 12-1 that is the dorsal lumbar junction because here the relatively hypomobile thoracic spine is being transitioned to a relatively more mobile lumbar spine and it is this transition zone which is the weakest and more amenable to fractures so this is a typical vertebra okay with typical parts so i'll just go through um, because this is basic stuff so i will not waste much more time on it i'll just go through it relatively quickly anteriorly we have the body extending posterior from the body you have the two pericles on each side and then on the back we have the spinous process and to laminae at the junction of the laminae and the pedicles we have the transverse processes and also at this juncture we have the superior articular facets and the superior articular facet will then form a uh, form a joint a facet joint with the inferior articular process of the spine above so this is the basic spinal anatomy in between we have the spinal canal and it is here where the spinal cord uh, goes through it goes through the spinal canal and if you look over in the sagittal cut you can see again this is the body we have the superior articular vertebral notch the inferior vertebral notch we have the facet joint the superior articular process we have the transverse processes this is the spinous process this is the pars interarticularis pars interarticularis is basically the area between the superior and the inferior articular facets and the importance of the pars interarticularis is that it is a relatively weaker area and sometimes these patients also present with pars interarticularis fractures Okay, so this is the ligamentous anatomy, and we have the anterior longitudinal ligament. We have the vertebrae, the body. So, the anterior longitudinal ligament is obviously anterior to the vertebral bodies. Okay, and in between the vertebral bodies, we have the intervertebral disc. Posterior to the vertebral bodies, we have the posterior longitudinal ligament, and then we have the spinal canal. And then posterior to the spinal canal is a very strong ligament, which is known as the ligamentum flavum, which overlies the cord. and it is uh, under the lamina so once you remove the lamina that is where you will find the ligamentum flavum and then posteriorly we have two ligaments uh, which forms the posterior ligamental ligamentous complex we have the interspinous ligaments and we have the supraspinous ligament so these ligaments are very important and uh, the importance of this ligament is because they give stability to the vertebral column okay, any injury to these ligaments can lead to an unstable spine so that is the importance of the ligaments we're not going to talk about specialized ligaments at the c1c2 junction because there is a completely different topic so this is just the basic ligamentous structure of the vertebral column and then uh, let's divide the vertebral column into three the vertebral column into three sections so we have the anterior column we have the middle column and we have the posterior column 
this basically this three column model is known as the adenosis three column model in which he divided the vertebral column into anterior middle and posterior columns the anterior columns consist of the anterior longitudinal ligament then we have one half the anterior half of the bodies so anterior half of the bodies and as well as anterior half of the annulus fibrosus of the disc this is the anterior column the posterior column consists of the posterior half of the vertebral bodies as well as the posterior longitudinal ligament then the posterior this is the middle column then we have the posterior column this posterior column consists of ligamentum flavum it consists of the interspinous ligament the supraspinous ligament as well as the facet capsule so this all of this these three components is 1 2 3 and 4 the facet joint they form the posterior ligamentous complex which is a very strong complex which again gives stability um the pedicle is a part of the middle column but the lamina they are part of the posterior column so i just wanted to mention that and the posterior column itself alone does not cause instability unless the facet joints both facet joints are disrupted okay so let's first uh, talk a little bit about what happens when the cord is injured so okay now uh, we're defining the spinal cord injury and then we have divided the spinal cord injury basically into two types a primary injury and a secondary injury the primary injury is the injury that occurs at the time of the impact it is the initial traumatic force it is a primary injury at the time of the impact uh, whatever that impact is it can be a motor vehicle accident it can be a fall but at that time the primary injury has already occurred and the patient presents to you to the hospital with the primary injury already uh, the primary injury has already been done with okay so there's nothing you can do about the primary injury so primary injury occurs at the time of the impact and it leads to disruption of the neurons glia and blood vessels either indirectly or directly and how indirectly does it affect it can be through shock waves or directly it can be through any direct compression second through any fracture dislocations can be subluxations lacerations dislocations can be second to any assault such as missile injuries so the primary injury is already present when the patient presents to you and there's nothing you can do about the primary injury and it is a primary injury that will define to you how the patient will actually present to you if the patient comes to you with severe primary injury he will already be quadriplegic and there's nothing that you can do to um, relieve that you know you can make a patient walk again if the cord has been transected so the primary injury is an injury that occurs at the time of the impact and it has already been well defined when the patient is presented to you and you're not going to treat the primary injury but what you can do is you can prevent the secondary injury from happening okay you can prevent things from getting worse so what is a secondary injury it is a series of biological phenomena that begins between minutes and can continue to impact weeks or even months following the primary injury and is basically the prime the secondary injury that we're going to treat when the patient comes to us okay so the secondary injury is two phases there's acute phase and there's subacute phase remember what we talked about in primary injury we said it disrupts the neurons glia and blood vessels so the disruption of these structures will ultimately lead to certain sequelae which will then result in secondary injury so in the acute phase there can be vascular damage which can perpetuate cord ischemia Uh, it can lead to infarction of the cord it can lead to hypo hypoxia of the uh, of the neurons itself so vascular damage we have ionic imbalances then uh, these patients can also free radical formation and these free radical uh, radicals in turn damage the cord itself there is local inflammatory response that is there is a sudden flux of inflammatory cascade inflammatory cells macrophages neutrophils lymphocytes into an already damaged cord which will then further lead to cord edema and hypoxia and lead to further cord damage and then we also have neurotransmission electric uh, neurotransmitter accumulation which can lead to excitotoxicity and that can also lead to injury this is what happens in the acute phase and then in the subacute phase we can have any debalination of the surviving neurons there can be valerian degeneration there's matrix remodeling and ultimately there's also formation of a glial scar so we have to prevent all of that from happening we have to prevent any hypoxia ischemia any ionic dysregulation any neurotransmitter accumulation free radical formation 
we have to uh, manage the disruption of the blood brain barrier which is very important and inflammatory response as well as apoptosis and necrosis so we have to work through all of that and we have to make sure that none of the second injury happens that is the basic management that you will do to a patient who presents to you with an already primary injury which has already occurred at the time of the impact so you have to manage secondary injury from happening as well as to stabilize the spine and to stabilize the damage that was done at the time of the impact So moving on, let's uh, create a scenario and let's take the spinal cord injury from the beginning till the end. So which of the cases are you su are you supposed to treat as a spinal cord injury until proven otherwise? Because a patient does not walk into you and tell you that is he's having these problems. These patients, they have gone through high motor vehicle accidents not really in the state of mind most of them are not even conscious so they cannot tell you if the spinal cord is injured or not and you have to pick certain things you have to pick certain things during your history during your examination that suggests a spinal cord injury especially in a patient who is not conscious to tell you in which you cannot go and you know if the patient is a low gcs and you cannot go through a neurological examination so you don't really know what level of injury is these are the patients in which you will suspect there's a high suspicion of a spinal cord injury until proven otherwise and the four uh, conditions under which you will suspect a spinal cord injury so we have any victim of significant trauma what do i mean by significant trauma these are patients who present with high speed motor vehicle accidents uh, which can lead to any ejection from the vehicle during uh, the rta it can also lead to any rollover injuries uh, it can be the speed of the vehicle maybe it is moving more than 100 kilometers per hour and it is these patients which are again at more risk of developing a spinal cord injury then we have trauma patients with loss of consciousness because you have to treat these patients as a spinal cord injury until proven otherwise because the patients are not conscious enough to tell to you themselves so any patient who presents to you with loss of consciousness a patient with a trauma history with significant trauma these patients should be suspected to having an SCN unless you rule it out you have to give the patient a collar and then we have minor trauma patients with complaints referable to the spinal spinal cord maybe they're complaining of neck pain maybe they're complaining of paresthesias in the limb maybe the weakness in the lower limb and then you have associated findings suggestive of SCI which include any abdominal breathing or priapism and uh, this mainly tells you about autonomic dysfunction so then you have to triage these patients you have to ask a quest certain questions you have to if the patient is not conscious then you have to ask the bystanders who have witnessed the rt and you have to ask them certain things whether the trauma was significant or not a significant trauma we have already talked about that uh, you know what most of the patients that come to us for they complain that they've been working on electricity poles and they've fallen for more than 15 foot height and that is very significant for an sci okay so the uh, height from which they have fallen the mode of the trauma sometimes patient they dive into pools or rivers or um, any water body and they come with paralysis and that is because they probably uh, dive into shallow end of the of the pool or the river and they've hit the head on something which will lead to a cervical cord injury so you have to clearly take a proper history of the trauma you have to ask about the mode of the onset you have to ask about uh, whether it was significant or insignificant and then we move on to neurological deficit is the patient alert is he oriented and if he is alert and oriented is he giving any history which is suggestive of a spinal cord injury is he complaining of neck pain is he complaining of tingling sensations in his limbs is he complaining of inability to move any of the limbs okay and then if he's intoxicated or not uh, so this these patients cannot we cannot take what they're saying uh, for granted we cannot reliably uh, believe these patients right so unless the intoxication wears off we have to treat these patients as a possible case of spinal cord injury then you have to look for any complaints which are referable to the spine such as neck pain back pain extremity tingling paresthesias and these are recommendations for c-spine clearance okay so if a patient presents to with blunt trauma with mechanisms which is suspicious of spine trauma then you have to see whether the patient is severely injured if he's in, in any altered mental status such as if he has low gcs if there's any evidence of intoxication and uh, that's important here because a lot of these patients are drunk drivers especially in developed countries then you have to look for any certain neurological deficit if there's any thoracic or the significant distracting injury and 
if uh, this is present if any of these things are present then you immobilize the patient you immobilize the patient you have to immobilize and you have to manage the patient as a case of spinal cord injury until proven otherwise if none of these is present then you have to ask if the patient has significant spine pain or tenderness if yes then again immobilize if he does not then if the patient is awake if the Jesus is not low because we've already ruled that out right so if the patient is awake we'll ask the patient if he is voluntarily able to flex extend or rotate the spine whether it is a cervical spine whether it is a uh, the dorsal spine so if he's voluntarily able to move the spine without any pain in each plane then you do not need immobilization but if he is not able to do any of these things then you again immobilize the patient also this is an isolated penetrating trauma the patient does not have any of the symptoms so no immobilization for the evaluation treatment may be required a sophisticated point of care and this is mainly uh, done at the point of the trauma and, uh, at the point of the accident or maybe in the ER when you're triaging these patients now let's talk about management in the field whether it is a field or ER or your ward any patient who comes to you with history of trauma should be managed according to the ATLS protocol there are no buts and ifs about it if a patient presents to you with trauma in any setting you have to manage the patient according to the ATLS protocol and simply put ATLS protocol is airway management and immobilization of the cervical spine breathing and ventilation circulation and hemorrhage control disability exposure environmental control okay if during this primary survey you see any life-threatening conditions they should be identified and treated okay so again I will I cannot stress more upon the importance of the ATLS protocol because this ATLS protocol will actually is the first point in your management this is the first thing it will clear away any life-threatening conditions and may be present they should be managed first and they will also tell you how, what to do about the patient what to expect from the patient what is the prognosis of the patient so this is the first step that you do in any trauma patient make sure that the air is intact and how do you look the patient's conscious and if he's talking and you do not hear any stride, you do not, um, you know, you know, the patient's unconscious. Look for any facial injuries, look for any deviation of the trachea, look for any strider or abnormal sounds coming from the mouth. That will tell you whether the airway is intact or not. And again, if the patient has low GC, especially if it is less than 8, then you have to secure the airway. You have to pass the tube and secure the airway. And you have to restrict the cervical spine. You have to immobilize the cervical spine because cervical spine contains cervical cord and damage the cervical cord will mm, eventually lead to death so you have to be really careful about the cervical spine and uh, how you need to immobilize we'll talk about it later on then again make sure the patient is adequately breathing uh, that that the chest rises bilaterally symmetrical and then there are no there are no paradoxical movements there are no bruises and the, the air entry is bilaterally equally is equal bilaterally equal and look for any active bleeding check if the patient is hypotensive or not if he's hypotensive maintain double two large four IV lines and give fluids to the patient arrange blood control the bleeding and then look for any other disabilities such as any fractures maybe the patient might have a femur fracture uh, he might have so many other injuries and might need urgent attention so you look for that and then you expose the patient so what is the initial management of a spinal cord injury so since our topic today is spinal cord injury and its management will restrict ourselves to that so initial management of spinal cord injury spine immobilization maintain blood pressure maintain oxygenation as well as brief motor examination okay so we'll talk in detail about these three things and how do you mobilize the spine immobilization of the cervical spine is of utmost importance and we've already talked about that because cervical spine controls it is the link between the brain and the body so it needs to be protected it needs to be immobilized also it is very exposed part of the spine and it is highly amenable to any kind of trauma so you have to mobilize it to uh, make sure that there's no further damage to the cord and there's certain ways to do it first of all you need to know how to place your hands and what we usually do is that the, the fingers the palm and the fingers should be just behind the shoulder blades over here on both sides the thumb should be in front and this area that your thumb as well as uh, the lateral aspect of your palm should keep the alignment of the cervical spine it should keep it in perfectly straight alignment the arms over here the forearms 
would be keeping the head in the line this patient is on a spine board and how do you mobilize on a spine board first of all you can apply any cervical collars what we usually use are philadelphia collars uh, the aspen collars and the smimey collars as well but if you have a philadelphia collar that's you know that's good you apply it and then for transporting this is for many transporting patients from field to the er from er to the ward basically shifting of the patient so you keep it the patient a spine board then you uh, put two sandbags on each side of the spine and then you fix them with a the duct tape the duct tape should cross the forehead as well as the chin and if the patient already has a cervical colon in place it should uh, cover the upper portion of the, of the collar upper portion of the collar and then this is how you properly restrict the cervical spine this is how you do it then this is log roll for transfer this log roll is uh, basically for transfer and to remove the patient from the spine board and that is important because the spine board can cause decubitus pressure ulcer so you need to remove the spine board it can also be used as as for primary survey to check if there's any back injuries if there's any bruising over here uh, so it has two functions and this is a typical four person log rule that they have shown in this picture so as you can see we have two people over here they're standing uh, on the left side of the patient and they are in control they are responsible for maintaining to keeping uh, the body and the limbs in alignment and we have one person in the head and his and his job is to keep the head in alignment with the rest of the body and there's no excess movement at the cervical spine this person that is standing over here is mainly when they're going to log roll this patient is responsible for removing the spine board as well as to check for any injuries in the spine so as you can see uh, these two people they rotated the patient they log rolled the patient this person over here kept the cervical spine in alignment with the rest of the body and he made sure that there's no uh, movement no uh, unwanted movement at the cervical spine then she will remove the spine board and once she's removed the spine board she will also palpate the spine for any injury and then the patient is put back on the stretcher okay management blood pressure so let me first uh, talk about something uh, really important over here. The management of the blood pressure, we're talking about shock. Why do these patients present with low BP? Why do patients with spinal cord injury present with low BP? And this is important because uh, these patients have taken three reasons for it. The first reason uh, it could be there can be interruption of the sympathetics. There can be interruption of the sympathetics due to the cord injury that usually occurs in, heart, in injury above the T1 level, so cervical cord injury. Patient with cervical cord injuries, if the autonomic nervous system or the sympathetics are disrupted, these patients will uh, lose the vasoconstricting ability. That will lead to vasodilatation of the blood vessels. Okay, so that will that is a cause of the low BP, and also unopposed parasympathetics will lead to bradycardia. So that will further uh, accentuate the hypovolemia in these patients. That is the first cause. Another cause is if the patient is paralyzed, there is obvious loss of muscle tone. And we all know that muscle tone is important uh, to avoid venous stasis, to avoid pooling up of the blood. So if there is loss of muscle tone, there will be pooling of the blood in the limbs and that will again lead to relative hypovolemia. Third cause would be any associated injuries because these patients usually present with polytrauma. If the patient have other injuries such as a femur fracture or a pelvic fracture, then that would again lead to hypovolemia. So all of these are cumulative that is a cause of low BP in these patients but why do we want to keep the systolic blood pressure above 90 because this is very important that is because we previously talked about second wind and we talked uh, about how this disruption of the blood vessels uh, which can lead to cord ischemia and cord infarction and hypoxia and we need to prevent that and for ox for to prevent hypoxia we need blood to deliver the oxygen to these already insulted and wounded neurons they need more oxygen to recover and for that you need to maintain a proper blood pressure there should be more than 90 mm Hg. okay so keep the blood pressure above 90 this is very important to uh, prevent secondary injury and to prevent cord hypoxia or cord ischemia you have to give we give presses if necessary give fluids initially but if needed you can give presses and why are we giving presses because we just talked about it that in patients with high cervical cord injury there's loss of sympathetics and this loss of sympathetics will uh, then lead to vasodilatation. So we need presses. And dopamine is the agent of choice. Avoid phenylephrine. Why are we avoiding phenylephrine? 
is because uh, it is a non-inotropic phenylephrine is a non-inotropic drug right and there might be possible reflex increase in vagal tone which will lead to further bradycardia and we cannot afford that in patients with SCI because we talked about it early on that uh, unopposed parasympathetics can lead to bradycardia already so we do not need another drug which will further accentuate this bradycardia then we need fluids as necessary to replace these losses we can also use military anti-shock trousers if available uh, this military anti-shock trousers they immobilize the lower spine and they compensate for lost muscle tone okay in, in a cord injury so they prevent pooling of blood in the muscles and the important thing is to maintain oxygenation keep oxygen saturation above 90 percent and we know why because again we need to prevent second injury and we need to prevent cord hypoxia so keep oxygenation above 90 percent uh, if, the, if there's no indication for intubation, then use a nasal cannula or a face mask. Intubation for airway compromise or hypoapnea. So in a spinal cord injury, hypoapnea may be due to paralyzed intercostal muscles or paralyzed diaphragm. Okay, so that will also um, point towards a spinal cord, cervical cord injury because phrenic nerve is the nerve responsible for activity of the diaphragm. So that is at the level of C, so that is supplied by C3, C4, C5. So cord injury can also lead to hypoapnea. It can also be due to depressed level of consciousness since these patients present with polytrauma. So again, intubate if there is low GCS. Caution with uncleared spine. If you're intubating a patient who does not who does not have any clearness of the cervical spine already done, he does not he has not gotten his cervical X-rays done. The patient is unconscious. You cannot uh, reliably say if he has any limb movement or if he has any cord tenderness or not. So in these patients, use, uh, you know, use, uh, if you're intubating these patients, then do it with caution. Use chin lift with neck extension and jaw thrust it should not be done. Jaw thrust is not recommended in these patients. Only chin lift and avoid tracheostomy cricothyroidotomy in case you need to go for any surgical intervention. Management in the hospital. Again, stabilization and initial evaluation, immobilization, maintain the BP give 100% uh, oxygen if the patient has a low GCS and if he um, appears to if there's risk of aspiration these patients and pass an NG tube catheterize these patients give DVT profile access since these patients are going to remain immobilized for a long period and temperature regulation and that is uh, another important part, part because in patients who present with cervical cord injuries these patients also have uh, autonomic dysfunction they cannot regulate the body temperature so they wouldn't know that they're hot and they wouldn't know that they're cold so these patients can have danger dangerously high levels of fever and the body will not react to it the body will not uh, homeost and uh, you know use this mechanism of homeostasis to regulate this uh, temperature so temperature monitoring is very important in these patients again check electrolytes go for more detailed neuro evaluation and radiological evaluation we talked about uh, hypovolemic shock but another shock that i want to talk about over here is neurogenic shock which is again common in cord injuries neurogenic shock is complete loss of uh, of neurological activity below the level of the lesion that is the cord or the neurological system is completely suppressed following a trauma it will lead to flaccid paralysis can lead to autonomic dysregulation and can lead to uh, loss of all the reflexes okay and again this is an autonomic dysfunction so these patients are again prone to developing uh, shock as well hypovolemic shock as well okay, so now you manage this this patient we're done with the management we have initial this is initial management we have resuscitated the patient and we've stabilized him for now now once the patient stabilized you need to grade what kind of injury it is uh, you have to ascertain the level of the injury okay so this was asia classification asia's international standard for neurological classification for spinal cord injury so ic and, and csci classification it is basically to it is a chart that makes neurological examination easy and it tells you what important things to look for during a spinal cord evaluation so on the on the right side we are evaluating the right side of the body and the left side we are evaluating the left side of the body so as you can see this is the right this is the left and then we have motor and sensory motor and sensory in motor we are only going to look for key muscles at different myotome levels so these are the different myotomes and the muscles over here are fixed like c5 are elbow flexors c6 are wrist 
extensors, C7 elbow extensors. So these are relatively fixed. So these are the key muscles and all these levels are uh, checked. And how do you check them? This is an MRC greeting for that. So this is the motor greeting. Zero would be total paralysis. One would be palpable visible contraction. Two would be active movement with gravity eliminated. Three is active movement against gravity. Four is active movement against some resistance. And five is active movement against full resistance as well as normal movement. So you grade the muscles according to this in all of these levels. Then you have the sensory uh, counterparts. You have light touch and pinprick. And these are different dermatomes. And you can see the dermatomes over here. So these are the different sensory points or dermatomes at which both light touch and pinprick are assessed on both sides. And how do you score the sensory system? We have zero is absent, one is altered, two is normal, and ND is not testable. So this is how you score them. And uh, then these are the motor subscores and the sensory subscores. This is the upper extremity and upper limb. Uh, and then left and right, upper extremity, left and right, and they add the, that up and then the same for the sensory. And then after all of this is done, we have to determine the neurological levels. And what are the neurological levels? We have to determine the sensory level, the motor level, the neurological level of injury, whether the injury is complete or incomplete. And then you have to grade that according to the age and impairment scale. Right, and we'll talk about it in detail later on. So these are steps in classification. So you determine the sensory levels of right and left side. So the most caudal intact dermatome, that is your sensory level. What is your motor level? It is the lowest key muscle function that has a grade of at least three. What was grade three? It is active movement against gravity. And why is this important? Because against gravity is useful movement. If you can move your muscles against gravity, then this is useful movement. That is your motor level. So the lowest key muscle function that is a grade of at least three. Then the neurological level. This is important. What is the neurological level of injury? It is the most caudal segment of the cord with intact sensation and anti-gravity muscle function strength. So the most caudal segment of the cord with intact sensation, anti-gravity muscle function strength. That is your neurological level of injury. Uh, and what is the difference between these two? Because in the neurological level of injury, you're incorporating both sensation and the motor. So intact sensation and anti-gravity. So the patient's intact sensation at one point, but he does not have a grade of at least three. That is not in neurological level of injury. These two things should be satisfied. The patient should have an intact sensation. He should have a power of three or more. That would be defined in the neurological level of injury. If the patient has intact sensation, but power of one, you will not define that as a neurological level of injury. And you have to determine whether the injury is complete or incomplete. And we'll talk about it later on. And then you determine the age impairment scale. So this is sensory level assessment. These are different dermatomes of the body. And again, the most caudal intact dermatome is considered a sensory level, not a neurological level of injury, the sensory level. Right, and these are different dermatomes. A uh, little chart for certain key dermatomes in the body, which you can assess. And this is the Asia sensory grading system, which we talked about previously. Zero is absent, one is impaired, two is normal, and NT is not testable. And this is a motor level assessment, different myotomes at different levels. Okay, so the key muscles should be tested on both sides with strength and graded on a six point scale. The motor level is the most caudal level with grade three or higher, and all levels above being normal. And we already talked about that. Now, when to test non key muscles? Again, this is not so important, so I'll just skip this. What is the neurological level of injury? This is important. So this is the most caudal segment of the cord with number one, normal sensory, number two, motor function. Normal is defined as useful function. That is grade three or more on both sides of the body. The neurological level of injury is determined primarily by clinical examination and there's frequently discrepancy between neurological and bony level of injury. So that's fine because this is what you're doing for clinical assessment of the patient. And there can be discrepancies between the actual level that is the bony level and your level that you have seen. Okay, what is an incomplete lesion? An incomplete lesion, this is the completeness of the lesion. You have to define whether the injury is complete or incomplete and that will impact your management. An incomplete lesion means that there's some residual activity where the motor or sensory more than three segments below the level of injury. So you first define your level of injury and if there's any residual motor sensory function more than three segments below it, and this is an incomplete lesion. An incomplete lesion has better prognosis, much better prognosis than a complete lesion. 
and that is why your management over here will be completely different you will treat an incomplete injury as an urgent case you will treat it as soon as possible if surgery is recommended you will go for surgery as soon as possible so that this does not come this does not convert to a complete injury okay so this is very important remember whether injury is complete or incomplete so what is an incomplete injury there is any residual or motor sensory function more than three segments below cervical cord injury below the level of injury and this these are examples for example if a patient has a cervical cord injury but uh, on examination you can see there is movement in the lower extremity so this is an example of an incomplete injury if there is any sacral sparing an injury does not classifies incomplete with preserved sacral reflexes alone okay there is some common types of incomplete cord injury so uh, i will not go into much detail over it because this is a completely different topic and it requires a whole presentation to explain this but i'll briefly describe the four types of incomplete cord injuries brown cord and tiro cord syndrome posterior cord syndrome and central cord syndrome in brown cord this is uh, the incomplete cord injury with the best prognosis more than 90% of these patients usually are able to ambulate and more than 90% of these patients do not have any uh, fecal or urinary incontinence so this is the incomplete cord syndrome with the best prognosis and it presents uh, with ipsilateral motor paralysis due to normal the corticospinal tract as well as ipsilateral uh, proprioception and vibratory sense loss okay so that is ipsilateral involvement of both the corticospinal tract and the posterior column and contralaterally there is loss of pain and temperature beginning one to two segments below the level of the lesion we know why is that because the pain the spinothalamic fibers there are the lateral spinothalamic fibers that are carrying pain and temperature they ascend one to two segments uh, and then they decussate so the loss of pain and temperature would be one to two segments below the level of the lesion there will be preserved light touch because light touch or crude touch is carried by the anterior spinothalamic tract then we have the posterior cord syndrome sorry the anterior cord syndrome and anterior cord syndrome again there will be paralysis but these patients uh, will have loss of pain and temperature but the joint position sense the depression the vibration sense which are the function of the posterior column they will be spared okay so there will be loss of pain and temperature but the posterior column the position sense the proprioception vibration they will be preserved in posterior cord syndrome uh, this is very rare so this usually patient usually present with pain and paresthesia uh, which are often of burning quality in the neck and the upper arms as well as the torso and with the central cord central cord is the most common type of incomplete spinal cord injury okay uh, these patients usually have much pronounced motor deficit in the upper extremity as compared with the lower extremity they also have dissociated and variable degrees of sensory loss these patients have myelopathic symptoms such as sphincter dysfunction usually urinary and fecal retention like okay, what is a complete injury by definition there is no preservation of any motor and or sensory function more than 3 segments below the level of the injury in the absence of a spinal shock this is important because we previously talked about spinal shock briefly and we said the spinal shock in spinal shock there is loss of all neurological activity below the level of the lesion it can be temporary uh, lasting 1 to 2 days usually it lasts 1 to 2 weeks it can also last up to months okay so in the absence of spinal shock if we have confirmed that there is no spinal shock present and it is usually confirmed if the patient has bulbocavernosus reflex which is the first sign of a reversal of a spinal shock if the patient has preserved bulbocavernosus reflex then you can reliably rule out a spinal shock and if even in the absence of spinal shock the patient does not have any motor sensory function more than three levels uh, segments below the level of the injury then this is defined as a complete injury about 3% of patient with complete injuries on initial example develop some recovery so this is not significant at all complete is complete recovery is essentially zero of the spinal injury remains complete beyond 72 hours this is the age impairment scale uh, a b c d and this is important you can see a is the only one which is defined as a complete injury and b c d and e are b c and d are incomplete and e is normal the easy way to remember is that a for awful and e for excellent so a is bad e is good a is awful e is excellent a is complete cord injury which no motor sensory or sacral sparing b c d are incomplete and b sensory is intact but there is no motor function c is incomplete in which 50% of muscles less than grade 3 less than grade 3 matlab uh, this means that this, these patients do not have useful key muscle function so this is again bad 50% of muscles less than grade 3 incomplete is 50% of muscles more than grade 3 so this is useful function they can raise their arms or, or legs off the bed 
and he is known. Now we talk a little bit about and quickly about radiological evaluation. For radiological evaluation, they develop two criteria. One is nexus, and the other one is Canadian C spine rule. We'll talk about that. In nexus criteria, uh, you have to see if the patient uh, meets all the low risk criteria or not. You have to see if there's any midline cervical spine tenderness, if there's any intoxication, if the patient is alert or not, if there's any focal neurological deficit, and if there's any pain for distracting injuries. If none of these are present, you do not. If none of these are present, then there's no need for radiography. The patient is awake. If he has no midline tenderness, if he has no neurological deficit, then no need for radiography. If any of these are present, then yes, radiography is recommended. This is the Canadian C-spine rule. This is for patients who have a GC score of 15 and they are stable trauma patients in whom cervical spine injuries are concerned. These are awake patients. So these are high risk factors which maintains radiography if the age is more than 65. If there is any dangerous mechanism involved, if there is any paresthesias in the extremities. And what are these dangerous mechanisms? A fall from more than one meter or five stairs, an axial low to the head, a motor vehicle collision uh, at high speed or more than 100 km per hour, rollover, ejection, an immotorized recreational vehicular collision or a bicycle collision. So these are dangerous mechanisms. I mean, in these, if these three parameters are present, any of these, these are high risk, then you go for radiography. If they're not present, then you have to look for any low risk factors that allow safe range of motion assessment. Because we need to see, we need to ask the patient if he can move his neck or not. And for that, you have to rule out these. You have to see if there's any simple rear and MVC. If the patient uh, in the ER, in the, in the trauma department, the patient is in sitting position. If he can move and walk about during this period. If there's any delayed onset of neck pain and if there's no midline cervical tenderness. Okay, if none of these are present, then you ask the patient to rotate the neck actively. Okay, uh, and then if he is able to rotate actively with no pain and no problem, then no radiography. But if he's not, if and if these are present and if he's not able to rotate the neck, then you need radiography. Usually we go go with X-ray, we go with CT scans, and we go with MRI. Because these are three V cervical spine X-rays. We have the lateral view, the AP view, and the the open mouth or dentoid view for C1 and C2. So as you can see, uh, let me briefly tell you about three lines uh, that you have to see in an x-ray. Right, so this is the spinal laminar line, this is the posterior spinal line, this is the anterior spinal line. They should be complete alignment with each other with no step off. So as you can see here we have a step off. This is not in alignment. This vertebra and this vertebra are not in alignment with each other. This is a fracture of the C2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. C7 this is normal so this is a d1 fracture as you can see right so there is loss of alignment away with a very visible d1 fracture okay so this is the uh, the front ap view this is the open mouth odontoid view mainly done for c1 and c2 fractures this is the c2 this is the odontoid pack this is the body of the c2 and this is the lateral masses of c1 and as you can see they look fractured Compare this gap and this gap. And this gap is much larger than this gap. So this is probably a fracture of the C1 vertebra. And then uh, flexion extension x-rays are usually not recommended in patients if you have not ruled out cervical spine injury. So they uh, are only done cases in which a spinal alignment is intact and you want to see if there is any motion of the cords. Especially if the patient has been immobilized for 6 to 12 weeks in a cervical colon. You have to see if there is any subluxation or not. And you can see and this loss of alignment on flexion. So this uh, denotes an unstable spine. So these are uh, examples of a thoracolumbar lumbar fracture. This is a lumbar fracture. This is the fractured body. So this is the anterior column which is being fractured away. This is a CT scan. CT, usually we do it with 3D reconstructions. As you can see, this is a fracture of the body of C6 vertebra with a Fracture segment which is being dislocated in the spinal canal probably causing cord injury. This vertebra is fractured and compressed. Another vertebra which is being fractured and compressed, however, the, the canal appears intact. Uh, it is symmetrical overall. There is no retropulsion of the fragment to the canal. Okay, so this you can classify this as the patient might not have any cord injury. Over here we have these are the posterior spinous processes that are fractured. This is the axial view in which you can see that 
the whole body is fractured away and there's retropulsion of the fracture fragments into the spinal canal and the upper cervical spine okay. so again uh, this is fractured vertebral body to sublux and retropulsed into the spinal canal this line should be in alignment but as you can see it is crossed over into the spinal canal probably in a cord compression and as you can see over here you are able to identify the bones you can easily and very clearly see the bones and you can uh, classify the fracture on a CT scan but you cannot see the cord you cannot see the soft tissues away for that we get an MRI done and you can very clearly see the cord and this is subluxation uh, with subluxation with cord compression okay, so this is the cord is being compressed at this level um, there is no transaction however the cord appears to be ischemic again subluxation and cord compression this is the tear posterior tear now management of specific spinal cord injuries I will not go into details about it but uh, for unstable spine you have to fix you have to operate and you have to fix the question is if a patient presents to you with complete paralysis why are we fixing the spine we are why are we you know putting in screws and drawers and uh, asking the patient to go through such um, invasive procedure if we know that the patient will never walk again if the injury is complete there's very low chances the patient only three percent in fact the patient will recover so why are we fixating these patients mainly our goal in the patient with complete cord injury is to prevent any further complications these further complications can be related to delayed recumbency or uh, prolonged recumbency it can lead to decubitus or pressure ulcers it can lead to psychological impact on the patient can lead to chest infections so when we fix the spine we're basically allowing the patient to sit up if there's lower uh, cord injury the patient can at least sit up and ambulate and use his hands it will also uh, allow the patient to you know expect to rate there will be less chances of pulmonary infections or pneumonia there will be less chances of bed ulcers the patient can use a wheelchair he can use his hands to do his daily chores so that will uh, psychologically be a little bit uplifting for the patient so we either fix or we immobilize if the patient's unstable if the fracture is unstable and uh, unstable fractures are completely different topics so i'm not going to details about it but the fracture is unstable then you fix if the patient's fracture is stable then you immobilize the spine you can either use uh, non-invasive methods such as a cervical collar or you can use invasive methods such as a halo traction so again, thoracolumbar fractures with the fracture stable and the wedge or burst fractures and just immobilize the spine. Supportive brace may help. But if it is unstable, such as a fracture dislocation, then operative reduction fixation. If you're going through a conservative, then without paraplegia, you can give a supportive brace, patient's paraplegia, then bed rest. Okay, so treatment selection is controversial and it depends from and depends and different differs from patient to patient. So we will not go into much detail about it, but our main focus in these patients is to make sure that these patients have some improvement in the quality of life and that they do not develop any further complications and that's it thank you i hope you understood uh, what we talked about and i hope you understood why it is so important to make sure that to keep your helmets on do not use bikes do not drive rash always keep under the speed limit and always stay safe thank you